cost enormously. And if we just saved a little power, if we were efficient and we uh, were wiser in our use of power, we could avoid building some of these plants that they claim that we need. It's sort of like a waiter or bartender. The bigger the check is built, the greater the return you get at the end of the night. That's what our energy policy is premised on. Building big power plants gives a greater return to power companies, and so they're incentivized in doing so. And we want to change that model where people are incentivized to use renewable alternative power, reduce our carbon footprint, and uh, you know this is the gem we call Florida. If we want to make it more attractive and we want more people to come to Florida because tourism is number one, it's the wise thing to do. And lastly, what is happening right now in Tallahassee to, to maybe begin this process? Or, or what do you foresee happening in the next couple months? Well, sadly, not much in Tallahassee. That's part of the problem. That's why we're here. Because, uh, and what I proposed, and I proposed in the sessions of the legislature that I've been in, uh, legislation to repeal the utility tax, legislation to deregulate renewable power, uh, and to uh, make... Uh, have truth in billing so consumers would understand how much they're paying so they really you know get the why it's so get, understand how expensive it is to them uh, for them to have to uh, fund the building of power plants. Anything else I'm missing that I have to say? Well these constitutional amendments will go around the Florida legislature. Part of the problem is that you notice just in the last session of the legislature, $3.9 million was given to legislators, uh, and we think there may be a connection. Uh, we're not sure about that, but there just might be a connection between all the money that's given by the power companies to legislators in stifling uh, wiser, better, uh, more, modern, more modern energy policy. And that's what we need to change. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. coal plants and replacing them with clean energy solutions like solar, geothermal, and energy efficiency. Simply put, the brightest future for the Sunshine State is to invest in job-creating and money-saving clean energy solutions. Across the country, electric utility companies are investing in efficiency. Wait a minute, I knew I skipped the page here. Okay. All right, so why have we asked you to be here tonight? For a hearing on a hot July evening at the beginning of the hurricane season, just two days before a national holiday. What is so urgent? Why did we drag you here tonight? It's because we have a once in a decade opportunity to save consumers and businesses billions of dollars on our power bills and at the same time, steer the state of Florida towards a healthier, clean energy future. Energy efficiency is the cheapest, fastest, and safest way to meet Florida's electric electricity needs. The cost of coal, gas, and nuclear power is going up, while the price of solar power and efficiency programs keep going down. Duke Energy, Tampa Electric Company, and Florida Power & Light can give consumers a break by investing in energy efficiency, which saves consumers money and protects our health. Energy efficiency programs lower customers' monthly bills, saving consumers money and supporting Florida's economy. Now, does that sound worthwhile to you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's more. This year, the Florida Public Service Commission will set new standards for energy efficiency for the next 10 years under the Florida Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. This process presents an immensely important opportunity for us all. Energy efficiency is the cheapest, fastest, and the most reliable energy source. Source. If Florida's utilities, including Duke, Tico, FPNL, 
are required to achieve higher energy efficiency goals, their customers, that's all of us, will see lower bills, job growth, and the environmental benefits of an energy efficient economy. Now, across the country, utility companies are investing in efficiency to cut monthly in energy bills. And they're, and they're doing more on solar and wind. But Florida lags way behind most of, the, most of the country, as you will learn tonight. Florida's electric utilities have now submitted their requests to the Public Service Commission. And it's bad news. Their proposed energy savings goals are at unprecedented lows. And they want to eliminate solar pilot projects. This means we will have higher energy bills for ratepayers and pollution from new, unnecessary power plants. The Public Service Commission needs to hear from us. We asked for a public hearing. We asked them to come here to Pinellas County or somewhere else in Florida and hold a public hearing. They said, no. They're isolated in Tallahassee. It's comfortable to be there. They said, no. Here's a direct quote from the chair of the Public Service Commission. Quote, given the technical nature of this goal-setting procedure and no legislative directive to take public testimony, I do not find it necessary to hold a public hearing. Persons without the resources to intervene may file written comments in the docket. We are here tonight at the Citizens in the Hearing to make sure that all of our voices are heard. There is a court reporter present who will be recording our comments. We will have some experts testify and then hear from the public so that all of you can let the Commission know that you want energy savings to protect our health and lower our bills. This is your hearing and we encourage you to provide your comments tonight. Now I would like to introduce three of Florida's top advocates and organizers who are here with us. First is Julia Hathaway. Julia, raise your hand. <laughs> Julia is Sierra Club's representative who served as the first organizer for the Sunshine State Clean Energy Coalition and helped to coordinate tonight's event. The other coordinator of the hearing tonight is Sierra Club conservation organizer, Britton Cleveland. Britton, are you there? Britton, you raise your hand. And finally, I would like to turn the microphone over to the third person, Tim Heberlein, the, the political director of the Florida Consumer Action Network, one of the co-founders of the Sunshine State Clean Energy Coalition. I am happy to announce that Tim will join Sierra Club staff full time next week. Tim will serve as our MC for the rest of the program tonight. Tim, take it away. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, welcome. Thank you very much. Ooh, that's very loud. Um, my name, as Frank mentioned, is Tim Heberlein. I'm the political director of the Florida Consumer Action Network, and I'll be your MC for tonight. And just before we uh, get started, I'm going to lay out some ground rules. Uh, we uh, will have some expert testimony, as Frank mentioned, as well as uh, receive public comment. Uh, please, when you're making your statements, please direct them at, as if the PSC, or to the commission, if you were, um, because we will be submitting these to uh, the official record uh, on the 21st in Tallahassee when the PSC has their, their hearing there. Um, so, as Frank mentioned, why are we here? The Sunshine State Clean Energy Coalition believes that your voices need to be heard, so thank you very much for coming. The PSC didn't think this was necessary, but by your presence here, obviously, they're wrong. Um, this is an important issue, and I'm so glad to be part of the team. Um, uh, your, again, your comments are being recorded, so uh, please direct that. When you uh, approach the, the microphone, please state your name, uh, your address, and uh, make your comments. So first, sorry, I have uh, some notes here. Uh, well, first I want to uh, recognize some of the elected officials in the room, and thank you very much for, for being uh, advocates for the coalition as well as clean energy solutions here in Florida. Um, first is uh, Representative Dwight Dudley. Yeah. 
Thank you, Council Member Don Rice. And also, County Commissioner Ken Welch. Thank you. City of Sem uh, Seminole Councilor uh, Patty Plantemuro. City of Beauport City Council Member Yolanda Roman. Roman. Gulfport Council Member Michael Fridovich. <laughs> and Safety Harbor Member uh, Andrew Zodro. <laughs> um, and I believe two of our speakers, uh, two of our elected officials, would like to make some comments. We're going to limit the comments uh, for the elected officials uh, to two minutes. So, um, first, Representative Dudley. Good evening. Welcome to District 68, Florida House of Representatives. I just wanted to open here tonight in talking about uh, the legislature and what they're doing on our behalf. And sadly, uh, there's not much happening there because uh, much of the, many of the proposals, I guess all the proposals actually, uh, have, been, have not been heard, uh, sadly. Uh, offered legislation to reorganize the Public Service Commission because it appears that they seem to favor uh, large utility companies in, in uh, granting rate hikes every time they ask for them. And this appears to be uh, the case virtually all the time. Uh, and we're wondering if there happens to be any connection between the $3.9 million uh, in contributions that were given just in this last session of the legislature or maybe in the $18 million that were given over the last eight years to the Florida legislature. Um, we have offered a, a, a whole host of variety of legislation to be useful to consumers, uh, such as truth and billing. You know, uh, in 2006, a law uh, was created to advance nuclear cost recovery. Uh, the uh, utilities, particularly Duke, uh, was taking billions of dollars they promised to uh, build a nuclear plant. They obviously, it's somewhat uh, historic at this point, they ran into quite a bit of trouble and uh, that was canceled, but they haven't returned the money yet. So we're, we're really wondering when that money's gonna come back, and, but we're not holding our breath. Uh, so, and under the law, they're allowed to continue to take billions of dollars. There's no end in sight. It's ad nauseum, ad infinitum. They just keep taking money. Uh, now, and, and we refer to this not as that wonky long name, but just the utility tax. So what are we doing in response to that? So we tried, we've offered legislation, both the sections of the legislature I was present to repeal the utility tax. Uh, it got no hearing, sadly. Uh, also, the Avalon tax exemption, uh, a number of uh, people here uh, work to try to get the repeal of the, or to uh, offer an Avalon tax exemption for businesses that would put renewable and alternative devices on their business. Um, and you would think that's a business friendly thing to do, so that would be a great thing to do, and the majority party and so on would, uh, leadership would shepherd that through. Well, that didn't happen either. And in fact, uh, it was stopped in committee, it was never heard, and uh, sadly, uh, no, no change occurred. So the legislature clearly is not the place for uh, change. Uh, Reuben asked you 40 years ago when he wanted uh, transparent government, government in the sunshine, went to the people. And uh, we've drafted two amendments, one to repeal the utility tax, one to deregulate renewable power. We think energy policy in the state of Florida needs to be changed and changed dramatically. So uh, be looking for those. Uh, we ask for your help in that, and uh, thank you for being here tonight and for your uh, uh, championing the cause and joining together so all our voices can be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Um, and now uh, for two minutes, uh, Council Member Darden Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Darden Rice and I'm your St. Pete City Council member with you here tonight. And I am proud to 
tell you that the city of St. Pete is one of the first green cities in the state of Florida, as well as uh, Pinellas County was one of the first green counties uh, and earned that designation um, a number of years ago. But I think all of us here in this room know that there are so many, that we're not going to stop there, that there's a whole lot more things that we can do to make our community greener. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're here tonight. I'm here because, like you, I also think it's important, and I believe that the state of Florida can achieve and enact a blueprint for a clean energy future. And in doing so, it'll help reduce bills, it'll support our economy, and it will create jobs. But we need a public service commission that will help us reach those goals, not stand in the way. We need a public service commission that actually is a consumer watchdog that listens to the public and not corporate profits. Now, thank you. now I'm, I'm your leader on the municipal level, and cities can do much within our sphere of influence to look at uh, good policies in terms of transportation, uh, our built environment, uh, waste and recycling. But at a certain point, we can only go so far before we need help and regulation and support from both the state and the national government. So I am here as your local leader to listen to your ideas to see what we can enact on the local level, but it's also our responsibility as your local leaders to speak to the Public Service Commission and to tell them what our communities want and need for a clean energy future. So I look forward to hearing your comments tonight and look forward to talking to you more at the end of our program. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much and appreciate your comments, uh, both of you, and for advocating for clean energy solutions. Um, so we are going to actually move into a testimony from three experts who will be invited to participate today. Um, the first is going to be Susan Glickman. Now, Susan is the uh, Florida Director for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, and uh, I will see the floor to Susan. Thank you very much for that. We have some slides, I think, coming brought up. Are you? I'm Susan Glickman. I'm the Florida Director of Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, and uh, I was involved in the 2009 and, of course, am currently involved in the 2014 uh, FECA proceeding on behalf of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and Natural Resources Defense Council. And as I go through a little bit, I'm here to kind of give you the background on what FECA is and, and what's happening and what the proposals are and why they're doing what they're doing. There we go. Very good. So um, we'll go to the first slide. So what is FECA? It's the Florida Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. And in government, people use all kinds of acronyms all the time. So I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Can I have the first slide? Oh. Is there something I'm supposed to do? You know, I actually am not a PowerPoint person, really, because I go off on the So Anyway, here's a little background. We'll go to the next slide. That just tells you about Southern Lines Clean Energy. They're an awesome group. So. Um, Anyway, I started to mention that we were involved in the FECA proceeding uh, five years ago, and that's kind of relevant when we get to what the uh, goals are that are proposed and sort of where we sit in 2014 versus 2009. So they set conservation goals every five years on a 10-year horizon, and it applies only to the bigger utilities. So those are the four investor-owned utilities. Seventy-five percent of the state of Florida are represented by investor-owned utilities, Tampa Electric, uh, Duke Energy, Gulf Power, and Florida Power and Light, which is the largest, but in FECA it also includes Orlando Utility Commission, which is what we call a muni, and also JEA, the Jacksonville uh, Utility as well. The idea of it is to improve efficiency, but as you heard already, and you're going to hear in more detail from me, uh, that's not what's going on. Uh, what the problem is, is the FECA proceeding is part of a disjointed planning process. In most states they have what's called integrated resource planning, where you put supply and demand on a level playing field. But in Florida, we break it up into sort of three different parts. We do a need determination when the investor and utilities or the big utilities want to build a new power plant. They want to prove that they need that power. And they do that in one proceeding, and then they sort of wrap that proceeding up. And then we go into FECA, where they do everything they can, and you're going to hear more about it, to prove that they can't save any more energy or they don't need to save any more energy. And then they wrap up that process. And then they do what's called a 10-year site plan. And the 10-year site plan is just merely the utilities writing out what it is they're going to build. And this is where you're going to see the cost.
conflict between uh, these things because they're arguing on one hand that they don't want to or they can't save energy. On the other hand, they've got four or five gigawatts in their 10-year site plan to build new energy. And just about a month ago, the Florida cabinet, Rick Scott and his friends on the Florida cabinet, just certified a 2,200 megawatt nuclear power plant to be built uh, accounting for one foot of sea level rise in Homestead, Florida. 2,200 megawatts of the most expensive power possible. As my friend Peter Bradford, a former nuclear regulatory commissioner, says, you do not solve world hunger with caviar. And that's what they're doing, and they're leaving the energy efficiency um, on the table. So, uh, next slide. So this is what we call a levelized cost slide, and I'm not going to go into it, but I don't, unless you don't see well, and I would include me, you can see where energy efficiency is the cheapest. Why would we not be meeting our need with the cheapest uh, thing possible? And by the time I'm finished here, you're going to actually understand uh, the, what's behind the curtain and why. So next slide. 20 states have energy efficiency standards. People are probably more familiar with what they call RPS, or Renewable Portfolio Standard. Whether you have a Renewable Portfolio Standard or a target for energy efficiency, that's just what they are, they're targets. So 20 states have those. We have a color because we're supposed to propose goals. We just don't do it. That's the process that, that we're in now. So next slide. The Florida lags behind other states. So there are 20 states that get a percent or a percentage and a half. So in the 2009 proceeding, we were in, in that proceeding asking for the utility to save 1%. That's 1% of annual savings each year. So 20 states get a percentage or a percentage and a half. Florida, back in 2005, was at 0.25. Okay, so 20 states get a percent, we're at 0.25, and we moved the needle about a tenth of a percent to 0.35, and of course, then they got rid of all the commissioners that uh, did that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So you can see what other states are doing. That was the point at which four of the commissioners that Charlie Christ had put on uh, exited stage left, and uh, Rick Scott's folks came in at on stage right. So the next slide. This is... Uh, a chart of what the utilities are proposing so you can understand the scale of what they're proposing. So Florida Power Line, which is the worst, they're my favorite, they cover half the state, so let's talk about them. So they are proposing goals that are 99% less than the already anemic goals in 2009. So when we move the needle from 0 0.25 to 0 0.35 in 2009, uh, Tico, Gulf Power, Orlando, and JE went off and they did their program plans. You set the goal, then you come back and get your program approved, and you go off and you do your program. So they actually were, were good actors given them. Florida Power and Line and Duke covered half the state, two big utilities. They rescheduled their program plan, 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 and lo and behold, four of the commissioners were ushered out, and the new commission set aside the penalties. So half the state is operating off 10-year-old goals. And I was wondering if anyone brought their rotary phone tonight. I mean, it is really the technological equivalent of that. So Tico is asking for goals 80% less than five years ago. Does everyone understand that? If you take nothing home, you need to understand the scale of how, um, it's not even just how little, to want to do a 99% less than we did five years ago in you know, a technological arena is absolutely um, you know, just unforgivable. But that's the, that's the scale of how badly they're doing. So next slide. And this is just a good slide. You can see where we rank Florida Power and Light, Duke, Gulf Power, Jacksonville, Tampa Electric, and Florida Public Utilities, which sends to a bunch of, of the muni. So Florida Power and Light is the winner at 107. And you wouldn't know that if you were in Florida Power and Line, every time you turn on the television, you would see a television ad talking about how fabulous uh, Florida Power and Line is. And the interesting part is Florida Power and Line's parent company, Next Era Resources, is the biggest wind energy producer and the biggest solar producer in the country. So they compete in 28 states. They don't compete here. And why should they compete here? Because they've got the sweetheart deal of the century. They are monopolies. Next slide. So this is the why part. This is the part where I pull back the curtain. Current utility regulation incentivizes building power plants we don't need. They are not just like waiters in a restaurant. They are like waiters in a country club where they get a guaranteed tip or a table of eight or whatever. So the more you spend, the more they make. They want to sell you that bottle of wine and that dessert, right? Because they're going to make more money. 
Why did they want to build nukes? And there's some people in this room who started, like myself, in 2005 fighting coal fired power plant proposals. They want to move major assets into their rate base because the more they do, the more they spend. They don't want to help you use less energy because they don't make money that way any more, more than McDonald's doesn't want to sell less burgers, right? So they tried coal fired power plants. At one point, there were seven coal fired power plant proposals. If we had a couple more hours, I'd share some of those funny stories. We would need beer for that. But uh, anyway, then they moved on to the nukes. So that came out of the 2004 and 5 hurricane season. It was all about diversifying our fuel mix because we're very reliant on natural gas. So the more they spend, the more they make. This is a report that happened in January of last year. The Edison Electric Institute is the mouthpiece for investor and utilities. And they wrote the report, Disruptive Challenges, Financial Implications and Strategic Responses to a Changing Retail Electric Business. Their business model is crumbling. It might have made sense when the, the system was set up that they made money selling electricity. In the 21st century, you make money by meeting people's energy need. It's not about selling electricity. So they know their business model is crumbling. Next slide. And to add insult to injury, it mentioned earlier jobs. We send $60 billion out of state every year because we don't have any, but we very, very, very minimal homegrown energy. So we could keep those dollars here at home. You know, this is the new paradigm. It's energy efficiency and solar power. But remember, too, Tampa Electric owns coal. Florida Power Lines parents company just brought a fracking company that they had an interest in. So they're, they're building Florida Power Line a new natural gas pipeline. They've got three new natural gas plants in the hopper. Uh, uh, Duke's trying to build two more natural gas plants at Crystal River. So next slide. This is, and the utilities know this. This just talks about, this was actually a survey of utilities, and they know that distributed generation threatens their business model. Next and there's a headline really from Barclays, and if you sort of Google this, um, when the report came out, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that coined the term death spiral about their business model. So utilities know it too. They're doing everything they can to squash it. That's what FICA's about, that's what building these plants are about, and that's what building the pipeline is about. And the next thing we are likely to see is an attack on net metering. So uh, who was talking about having solar? Uh, Frank is talking about having solar and net metering it back onto the grid. Again, that's another, uh, that's another whole session. So I'm going to sort of wrap up here with two things. Now here's the why of the why. Next slide. The why of the why is the money. So I just finished my 27th session. I've been in, in Tallahassee a lot over the years. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking insurance or the tobacco companies or, or whatever. It's all the same thing. It's a very, very money-driven process. It's more important than ever because on June 2nd, the EPA has come down with carbon pollution limits for the first time ever. And Florida has to reduce our carbon by 38%, and there are four building blocks to do that. And the cheapest one is energy efficiency. So it's even more important, and this is now in Governor Rick Scott's court because the federal government sets the, the, the limits, and then each state does a state implementation plan. So it's our governor and our State Department of Environmental Protection that are going to be making those decisions. So even more important than ever. Next slide. The politicians are out of step uh, with the public. So this is sort of some research done by the Natural Resources Defense Council very recently, and it shows that Floridians, and they do this because they believe we have a moral obligation to future generations to limit carbon pollution, and they support limiting carbon pollution. And Governor Rick Scott has yet to, act, to, to answer, and he has been asked on numerous occasions already, and your homework assignment is every single person here needs to ask Governor Rick Scott in some way, what is your plan for dealing with climate change, and what is your plan for meeting, with the, meeting the carbon limits, because it's now in his court. So next slide. And we have a website, and everybody is involved in it. It's sort of an unbranded campaign, so whatever organization you're a part of or your church, send it to this website. Um, we've probably got about 60,000 or so petitions so far, and we'll be delivering those to the governor. What's your plan, Gov? So with that, I'm going to listen to everybody tonight. I'm going to hang out and talk to folks, and if people want to get involved, there's absolutely... Uh, no justification. There is no excuse for what's going on. It is um, everything that you think is bad about politics 
happens in the legislature and is happening at the Public Service Commission, and the commissioners are afraid they'll lose their jobs if they don't do what the utilities tell them to do, and uh, it's, 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 it's quite striking. But I so appreciate everybody giving them their time uh, this evening and, and being out here, because we're not going to change things unless we do it together.
use that next year, the utilities are having a, a strong push to get rid of it altogether. What does that metering do? It means that your meter would be running backwards, right? So you're actually selling some money, some electricity back, uh, the excess electricity back to the utilities. They don't want to take that anymore. They can sell to you, but you can't sell back to them. The state requirements do vary. Next slide, please. And this is the part that really, you know, kind of got me. Ivan Williams, God bless him, he's here, uh, and the fantastic job that he's doing in reporting the facts, you know, about the situation. Um, back in, in uh, December of last year, I still say the same thing times, I kind of can't get past that, you know. Uh, but one of the P PSC commissioners who's been on the commission, appointed by Governor Bush, reappointed by Governor Chris, reappointed by Governor Scott, uh, said just last year, Florida wants more solar, but we just can't figure it out. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, ask what, ask what he, she said it. And I find this very strange because Florida has an amazing amount of resources. Florida has, in 1975, they established the Florida Solar Energy Center. I have worked with folks over there since 1980. And really, in the 1985, 89 period, they set up a certification program for photovoltaics. That's 30 years ago. Okay? So I am familiar because I work nationwide. I'm familiar that uh, companies that are developing solar products, that are developing solar systems, they come to the Florida Solar Energy Center to get their certifications. And all of those products that they certify are being used in other states, largely, not here. Uh, they have, uh, we have the Florida Building Code, the Energy Code with Fire Code. I, I participate in the development of the Florida Building Code uh, in the Florida Building Commission on, on some of their technical committees. And everything's already in the code. It's not like there's some kind of code barrier. It's all there. You know, uh, There are products that are out there, and believe me, I'm not here to promote any particular product uh, or system, but I will point this one out. This is a solar shingle, and this shing this is like an asphalt shingle. It installs on your roof, and this particular product, as most others, they meet the wind rating system requirements even in Miami Dade. And I know this because I was part of the team that got those approvals done. So I know that we have the expertise to do it. So how could someone say we can't figure it out? Is beyond me. Go to the next slide, please. The other thing we could look to, you know, have we ever thought about talking to other states on how they're doing it? You know, uh, uh, Susan had out there a desire, right? The, uh, it's another great website. You can get more information there and spend hours on your iPad, you know, up till 5 a.m. taking a look at the stuff on there. Seriously. But on there, you know, there's information about rebates. When you start looking through that, if you click through, yeah, there's plenty of incentives and plenty of rebates, except guess what? All the utility rebates are fully, they're, they're fully subscribed, no longer available to you, right? Because the amount is so small. Next slide, please. This is the part. Solar energy is not an experiment. Uh, we get this idea. I mean, I heard the CEO of one of the utility companies talk about, well, Florida has intermittent clouds. <laughs> True, true story, true, where's I been? I know, he, he said it. Well, New York and New Jersey has inter intermittent snow. And, and they are, they are actually, um, they're actually exceeding Florida by leaps and bounds in terms of the growth of renewable energy. And I know this because I, I travel throughout the country on this. So there is, there's no excuse. There's no excuse except the political excuse. So I'll end with uh, one slide here. I'm just laying out some facts for you. Um, you know, I'm not here, I'm here as a technical person, I'm not here as a, uh, to talk politics, although I did spend three years as a federal lobbyist and decided I could never deal with that ever again. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a tough business. It's a tough business. But we have to get involved in it. The PSC, if the facts are there, I mean, they really are. And to shut off conversation should be taken as, you know, such an insult. Really? Right. Such
such an insult and a, and a slap to our, our own integrity, you know, our own intelligence. You know, we're not smart enough to figure it out. We're not smart enough to have good, good comments. And I think that that's just a shame. So I'm going to ask you, I know people, you know, have been asking things of you, you know, contact Governor Scott, absolutely. <clears throat> what I want you to do is I want you to contact 20 other people because this room needs to be filled, right? And we need to get a lot more uh, people involved in this. And, you know, please remember, you know, it is we the people. Uh, it really is. And, and the last thing I'll ask you to do is to make sure in November that you vote and get your friends and family to do so. Thank you very much, Mrs. Austin, for sharing your uh, testimony. Um, next up is going to be Kelly Mark. Kelly is a senior uh, Beyond Coal campaign representative for the Sierra Club. And uh, Kelly, thank you. Good evening, folks. We are moving into the public testimony portion of the evening. So I'm going to kick us off. Um, my name is Kelly Martin, and I'm the senior campaign uh, representative with the Sierra Club with Beyond Coal campaign. And I'm here tonight to ask the Public Service Commission to set much, much higher energy savings goals than the ones that the big power companies have proposed. Because saving energy through efficiency is the cheapest, fastest, and safest way to meet Florida's electricity needs. There's a huge opportunity here in Florida to save more energy and more money starting right now in 2014. Simple things. Simple programs can go a really long way. Compact fluorescent light bulbs, modern appliances that use less electricity, energy audits, and good insulation so that air conditioning cools the inside of our homes and not the outside. And through setting strong goals, the commission should hold the big power companies accountable for helping all customers install these efficiency measures and gain the benefits of lower power bills. And the benefits of energy efficiency investments go far beyond low power bills. They help create local jobs. If the big utilities in Florida were to match the industry standard for investments in energy efficiency, that 1% of the previous year's retail sales that most, um, a lot of states, more than half the states nationwide are hitting, we would create here in Florida 900 jobs in the first year alone, and consumers would save $10 million on their electric bills over the life of these energy efficiency programs. But instead, Florida's power companies have proposed dramatic, unprecedented reductions from the modest annual energy savings that they currently achieve. That's a giant step backwards, and it means higher power bills, economic stagnation, and dirty air. And the low goals proposed by the power companies are unwise because they fail to look ahead and to acknowledge that saving energy can help avoid expensive new power plants and expensive pollution controls for the old plants. So just recently, as you've heard, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has announced historic carbon pollution standards. And they will require that we reduce our emissions in every state. And part of that is, includes a 1.5% annual energy savings, energy efficiency savings, um, related, which is relative to sales by 2020. And it is in every state, including Florida. And the utilities, propo that pro the utilities goals that they propose right now in this energy savings proceeding, also known as FECA, are nowhere near the standard. And so that means that they are failing to capture the savings for people's bills. Um, and they are also, uh, how on earth, how on earth is Florida going to meet the carbon pollution standards if they're not maximizing investments in energy efficiency? That's the cheapest, that's the fastest, and that's the safest way to reduce our emissions. So let's be clear, Florida ranks 27th in the country on energy efficiency. North Carolina, South Carolina, Ohio, all the other states where Duke Energy operates are all achieving much, much higher energy savings every year. Even Arkansas is achieving much higher energy savings every year. Um, and here's one reason why. So when the utilities propose the goals, they look at what's cost effective, which makes sense. 
But what happens is they're using a really flawed analysis to look at cost effectiveness. Nearly every state in the country has rejected the analysis that Florida company, companies are using. It's called the Rate Impact Measure Test and the two-year payback provision. And what these are is they're very limiting. They're really narrow ways to look at whether a particular energy efficiency measure is in the consumer's interest. And as a result, the companies, Florida companies, are missing out on most of the great energy efficiency programs that are working all over the country to reduce bills, reduce pollution, and protect our interests. All right, so I'm going to try out an analogy here. I think it's kind of like this to describe this cost effectiveness, so-called cost effectiveness test. Um, so pretend for a minute that you're at a breakfast buffet. Um, and you want to have a big fruit salad for breakfast, right? You want it to be full of delicious fruits that are chock full of vitamins and minerals and nutrients that are good for your health, right? And then you go up to the buffet and it's got this weird section where only the blueberries are available. And all the other fruits are like behind a glass cage that you can't get to. And then somewhere along the way you learn that maybe a pork company backs the restaurant and you start to think that might be weird. And then you see that your only option for this big healthy fruit salad that you want is these expensive blueberries. The watermelon, the oranges, the peaches, raspberries, grapefruits, they're all off limits, right? So what was going to be your big healthy fruit salad is limited to a boring, narrow option of blueberries that are more expensive than the other fruit. And then slowly the bacon starts to look pretty good. And the waffles look pretty good. And your pathetic blueberries aren't even looking very appetizing or cheap anymore, so why even bother? And so this little silly rule about what kind of fruit you can have um, means that you've ended up with a meal that has no vitamins, no minerals, little nutrition, and leaves all these delicious and lovely options left on the table. And that's how this screen works for the utilities, what they're looking at. It's an arbitrary rule. It limits the options that allow us to make the best choices for energy efficiency. It leaves awesome energy efficiency and solar programs on the table that consumers in Florida can't take advantage of. And it makes the options, much like the bacon and the waffles, it makes the option to build new, expensive, polluting power plants much more palatable. They all of a sudden look like better options than energy efficiency. And it skews the results toward options that make more money for the shareholders and less um, options available that save money for consumers and protect our health. So I asked the Public Service Commission to please leave behind this flawed test that the utilities use and allow customers better choices for energy savings, like it's happening all over the country. Because um, I'll close with this. So I'm a mom, probably like many of you in the room. And I like to make sure my kids eat the healthy fruits and vegetables, as you might have can tell from my analogy. But I have small three small children. And worrying about their future and what the future looks like really quite literally keeps me up at night. We're already feeling the impacts of climate disruption from super storms and severe temperatures to droughts out west and eroding beaches. Climate change is on our doorstep. And power plants are the largest source of carbon pollution that's causing climate change. This commission right now, this summer, has an opportunity to set easy, high goals for the utilities for energy savings. It's the cheapest way, the easiest way to reduce our reliance on dangerous and polluting fossil fuels, to reduce our carbon emissions, to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. Because our window to act on climate is closing. We are the last generation of people that can act. By the time that my three children are grown up and are my age, our window to act on climate will have closed. So I ask the Commission to please hear our call for more energy savings and set these high goals for energy efficiency that are on par with nationwide standards, to expand these narrow tests that utilities use to calculate what programs are cost effective, and to protect and expand the solar pilot programs. And by doing so, the Commission will help protect clean air and clean water and create jobs in the clean energy economy save millions of dollars for our consumers. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify.
before we go into public comment, I wanted to just address two things, or one thing really quick. Everyone who uh, came in this afternoon and got a program, there are two very important things that we'd like you to do in that program. Uh, the first is uh, there's a card here which has the declaration of uh, your uh, letter to the commissioner. Uh, please read it over and please sign it and please return it to uh, the individuals at the uh, desk when you first came in, check-in desk. Uh, the other uh, thing I'd like to mention is this, uh, after this, on the 21st, uh, as before mentioned, the PSC will be having their uh, public hearing on the 21st in Tallahassee. And we'd like to get as many people there as humanly possible. So if you're able to go, uh, we'll have folks uh, walk around with clipboards and please uh, sign up. We have them waving right here. Um, please make sure you sign up if you're able to go. It'll be a very exciting and fun event. So um, that being said, uh, we did invite Florida uh, Power Companies to join us tonight, uh, but they uh, politely declined us. Actually, we're all here. Oh, well, hey, look who we have here. It's Mr. Marcinogy. Oh, and Lynn Back from Duke Energy. Thank you very much. Glad you could make it. to make sure that your mic is uh, hooked up. We want to get every word you're saying. Can you hear me now? I am so glad to be here because I am Lynn Bagg from Duke Energy. And I want to just correct the record because we are really a financially responsible company that has a long record of wonderful customer service. Let me just address the issue about energy savings. You know, everyone's asking for these sweeping arguments for policy changes on this renewable energy demand-side management. And I have to tell you, these goals for energy efficiency are unrealistic. We have a good record already. And look how the building codes have been improved. Look how energy efficient appliances are available. We've made so much progress already. We really don't feel the need to go any further because we've done such a good job in the past. And may I add that we've been very responsible financially to our shareholders. Duke is a very strong financial company. But let me go on to the solar aspect. Everybody's talking about solar, solar, solar. Well, guess what? We tried the solar thing, you know? We tried that rooftop solar thing, and it just didn't work. I mean, we analyzed it, and we just didn't find that there was anything that was really available for that. And it really wasn't very cost effective. You know, our financial analyst looked at the, at, at the numbers, and it really just didn't crunch for us, you know. We're in the business of the rate payer exchange. You know, we have to do it by the numbers. This is accounting. This is... Money, we're talking about being responsible here. We just can't make these sweeping allegations that some of our environmental friends would make because in the real world, you have to deal with real solutions. And Duke Energy is proud to say that we've made great decisions and we hope to continue to do that. You really don't have to worry about public participation. We're, we're taking care of it, not to worry. Not to worry. Public participation.
sake of public education, I will address the issues raised for the purpose of correcting the misinformation that is so contrary to the public interest. Florida Power and Moot wants you to know that we have done all we can to help consumers and businesses save on energy costs. FPNL achieved 214 gigawatt savings in 2013. Isn't that wonderful? And we have now finished the job. I request to the Public Service Commission is to let us reduce energy savings programs by 99% next year. That's right. We want the Public Service Commission to approve an energy savings goal for the next year that is 100 times smaller than it was in 2013. Mission accomplished! No need for FBNL to make any more investments in energy efficiency. We're very proud. FBNL also wants to point out that our top priority is to build the Turkey Point nuclear facility. It will cost three times as much kilowatt hours as energy efficiency, but consider that means that much more money for our shareholders. FBNL's long-range planning for energy savings assumes that Turkey Point will be built. We are not going to analyze the impact that strong energy savings programs could have to reduce or eliminate the need for more power plants. We're not even going to go there. Yes, we know that energy efficiency saves consumers money when they lose less, less energy, but building new power plants guarantees FPNL and our investors a bigger profit. That's the bottom line, and it needs to be the bottom line for the Public Service Commission, too. Now, some have noted such so-called benefits of energy efficiency as improved health and safety, increased comfort, and reduced cost to participants in our programs. All of these alleged benefits, if they do in fact exist, are external to the traditional rate-making and jurisdictional bounds and therefore are completely irrelevant to the process. Some people are saying that we should set higher goals for energy savings to great jobs and lower bills. But there is nothing wrong with our proposed reductions. Their criticisms are unfounded and their recommendations are inappropriate, unnecessary, contrary to Florida statutes and rules, and not adequately substantiated by the evidence presented. Folks, it doesn't matter that utilities in half the states in the country are reaching energy savings that are 1% of the previous year's retail sales. We can't do that. But we can reach 0.01%. That's our pledge to you, the ratepayer. Let's talk about solar power. Some have made statements that FPNL is opposed to solar power generation through photovoltaics. Nothing could be further than the truth. This is a form of energy generation that FPNL has long been an industry leader in. Certain caveats do apply in order for this technology to be applied in a responsible manner. And it is a matter that the Public Service Commission and Florida Power and Newt are addressing in an intensive manner. So you need not worry. Just because we've asked the Commission to let the solar pilot programs expire at the end of this year and have proposed a goal of zero for renewable energy systems should not be construed to mean that we aren't following the rules. In fact, we've looked at the law, and it can be appropriate and consistent with the Florida Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act to propose a goal level of zero for demand-side renewable energy systems. It is not only permissible, it is preferred when programs are not cost-effective, as is the case here in Florida. A goal level of zero would best protect our shareholders, to whom we must meet our essential fiduciary responsibility. That is job one for Florida Power Loot. Thank you, thank you. I hope I've cleared up some of this information that you've heard tonight. You may all go home now. There's really nothing else to say. Thank you. resemblance to somebody I know, so. <laughs> so we're actually going to go on to the public, so yeah, I'm glad you stayed, didn't listen to him, but I'm glad you stayed in. We're actually going to move into the public uh, comment change. portion of tonight's uh, meeting. So again, with the ground rules. The photovoltaic panels that are on my house work well. I understand that at my home, we haven't paid a power bill to do or progress in over two years. I get that. I also understand solar works. I understand energy efficiency works. I understand energy efficiency is the least expensive option 
for so many people. I want to sum up by telling you about Martha. Martha is a woman who has come to Lakewood United Methodist Church, where my counseling center is. Martha comes in, and she asks for assistance with power bills, two months worth of power bills that total over $650. Martha is a single grandmother raising two children with no possible way to ever pay those bills. She lives in a sieve, living in her home. She actually, she's actually a homeowner. Her home was built in the 1950s, typical block style. She tries to air condition it. It's like trying to air condition a sieve. And I understand also that a few hundred dollars worth of energy efficiency Programs, savings, would go a long way in probably cutting that bill at least in half, along with some good energy conservation education. Martha is one of many. I'm closing it now. Martha is one of many. Every church, every synagogue, every mosque, every house of faith, every social welfare organization in Florida is deluged with people just like Martha every year. We need to call on the Public Service Commission to actually step up to help our brothers and sisters who can have affordable air conditioning in their homes, who can have affordable power. And we need the Public Service Commission at our request to stand up to help them. We have to do that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maria Jose Hayes. I live in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm um, here to speak to the PSC. B, PSC, yes. Um, you know, I may not be a financial analyst, but what I do understand is that under the state law, the PSC must ensure our electrical costs are as low as possible. And currently, we are ranked ninth in the country, but that is slowly changing due to increasing temperatures here in Florida. I remember last year, last summer, um, and I am not one to get overheated. I actually like it to be 75 degrees and I'm comfortable. If it's below that, I actually feel cold. So in my home, uh, I have the thermostat set around 78 to 80, and I like to keep it that way because it's energy efficient and my electric bills are low. But this year, I have noticed, because of the increase in heat and because of global warming, um, my AC is constantly running. Um, I am a single mother of two children on a single income. I don't receive any help. So for me, uh, utility bills matter to me. Just like I pay my rent, just like I pay my car insurance, utility bills are slowly rising. And that means less money for investing in my children, less money for them to go to after school programs, uh, less money for you know clothing, um, uh, deciding whether to pay the bills or to uh, you know opt out of uh, paying medical costs and things like that. So that's a huge concern for me. The other thing is that fossil fuel and nuclear power is expensive and harmful to our environment. While solar power is inexpensive, and we have an abundance here in Florida, we are the sunshine state. Um, and like the other gentleman that spoke, I suffer from chronic allergies um, and respiratory issues, and so does my eldest daughter. And this last spring, we had a ridiculous high pollen count. It made me so sick, I could not function, even to the point where I broke out into hives for several days, and I just couldn't, couldn't get rid of them. Um, you know, this affects us. It affects us financially. It, ex it affects our health. So, um, you know, in conclusion, we need financial, efficient, renewable goals here in the state of Florida. And Floridians just can't afford this anymore, and it's just not sustainable. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Steele Cosentino. I'm with the small public interest in Pinnacle, Camelot, Florida. Our mission, mission, goal is Florida first in quality of life and standard of living. And we have put together a program 12 years ago for a lot of reasons, but history repeats itself. So we're back again. The bridge is there. 
but we're smarter this time because we want to put solar voltaic panels not only on the French and Trail Bridge, not only on the two other bridges on Gandhi, but all the bridges in Florida, in Florida but all the bridges in Campbell Bay. So words are good. It's called the talk to talk, and there's a wonderful talk to talk tonight. But if you really want to do something, an actionable item, you know, something where it's, it gets done, and we're working together to get it done, uh, look at the 4th of July as independence from these four power companies. Okay, it's a new way of ripping up the 4th of July. We're independent of these people. We take control. And we can indeed put solar voltaic panels on these eight bridges we have. We could be solar there, okay? And that could work. But we all have to pull together to make it work. And we're asking for your help tonight to make it work. We can generate upwards of 100 megawatts of solar panels, or solar power. We call it mega solar watts. Instead of megawatts, give it what it is. Explain how the watts were generated. The other thing in our production of energy, you could all buy uh, solar voltaic panels and then join the co-op. And then we could install your panels on the bridges. There's a lot more to it. We have a website. Thank you very much. And thank all of you for being here. They are on the Public Service Commission and the folks that are up there making decisions on our behalf. Uh, you know, I've traveled all around, probably to every city in the state with Susan and some others, you know, working renewable energy. We're a trade association. We essentially represent the uh, solar businesses, renewable energy businesses in the state. And I can tell you that just like the folks of you that are in this room tonight, there are pockets, pockets all across the state of people that are very serious about <laughs> taking control and taking uh, uh, renewable energy a little bit more serious than some of our, our decision makers are. Um, right now, you know, we can tell you that firsthand there is this drumbeat, there's this slow and steady drumbeat. And every time uh, another nuclear power plant gets commissioned, the drumbeat's a little louder. Every time a million dollars flows into the coffers of you know, whoever's campaign and so on and so forth from the utilities, the drumbeat's a little louder. Every time the public is denied input in a process where of all times the public should have input in that process, the drumbeat's a little louder. And I can tell you uh, without question that if the Public Service Commission doesn't take their obligations to the public serious, that the citizens and the public and the residents in the state of Florida are going to take it upon themselves <coughs> to take control and make change. I just want to say uh, to everybody that's here, awesome, congratulations, love the blueberry analogy. For those of you, this is great to have this many elected officials, Representative Dudley and all the commissioners here. Seriously, fantastic. A great job to uh, select the audience and send you switch on the state for the coalition. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Sharp. I live at 8705 Cove Court in Tampa. That's the other side of the bay. Uh, thank you very much to the commissioners uh, for allowing me to speak. Uh, first, I'd like to... Uh, solve Ms. Ross's question about uh, why is it's so hard to do solar energy in Florida. And uh, the best statement is someone who once said, it's really difficult to get somebody to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. Um, <laughs> I'd like to let her know the, the, the floor of my condominium is at nine feet above sea level. How many people? This is our, uh, How many people in this room uh, have a floor level within the first, say, 20 feet above sea level? Uh, just for the record, I'll just say that over half the hands of the people in this room uh, indicate they live at or near sea level. All it's going to take is one storm surge to wipe us out. This state, Florida, is right at the edge of survivability, and any more global warming is going to put us literally underwater. And We've got to do everything we can to make this work, to, to make energy conservation and renewable energy sources work. Basically, we've got to get away from fossil fuels, and we've got to do it now. I'd like to ask everybody in this room to commit to going to Tallahassee, whether it's on the bus or with the, in, a, in a private transportation. If the bus is over full, I'll take four people in my Prius. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in Tallahassee. Gerald 
Golden. It's G E R A L D G O E N. We live at Janet and I live at 1104 Clippers Way in Tarpon Springs. We have lived there for 20 years. We are no longer Hoosiers. We are Floridians. Our burial sites are in this county. <laughs> Don't say that lightly. Let's get serious for a moment. There are 20 solar panels currently sitting on a wastewater plant in Tarpon Springs as a $50,000 pilot project that is one year old. It is working. If you are accepting any kind of exhibits tonight, here's exhibit number one about that project. There is article after article after article appearing in the news to tell us that solar saves money. Science, scientists uh, recently told us in May of this year that the Tampa Bay is in the crosshairs of climate change, and Senator Nelson called a conference in April of this year because the flooding in Miami Beach streets, the beach erosion, and the salt water contamination, and you may not know too much about that, are occurring now. The Pinellas, Pinellas County is ready to move on solar and other alternative sources. I won't pretend to speak for that, because Commissioner Welch is here, but he knows about a year ago I wrote him and challenged the county as well as the school system to do everything they could to put everything possible on alternative energy sources for this county. He wrote back, and with your permission, I'll read this sentence. <laughs> it, is, it is positive. Thank you for your letter, Carol. The Commission is moving forward with the RFP and PACE implementation. We are looking forward to moving this initiative forward in collaboration with other citizens and municipal powers. Ken Welch. There is a solar field at the entrance of the Florida Gulf Coast University that is producing 18 to 20 percent of the university's electrical needs. It is headed by Dr. Joseph Simmons. He was brought here from Arizona specifically to head the research program there. I have been in contact with him. This is not entirely a political issue, I will momentarily. This is a moral issue. It is a survival issue. It is an issue about what I give to my children, my grandchildren, and as of four weeks ago, my great-grandchild. Don't let me have to say, I am sorry, your mother and I left you this mess. <laughs> My name is uh, Felix Lovato. I came from Orlando because this is important. And I'm glad to see you uh, uh, faces. very seriously. Let's start first with uh, these uh, talks about sea level rise. I've done some calculations and the bottom line to me is that whether it's 2060 or uh, 2100, the thing is that most of these processes physically, I'm an engineer and uh, you have to put, you know, not that I've been doing these studies, I'm just using other people's uh, data, but basically if it's an exponential process, you have a catastrophe because you don't see anything really happening until the last 10 years. So this is something to be taken very seriously, uh, especially the calculations I just uh, read that NASA has started in October to fly over uh, Greenland to get better data. So we really need to get on the ball on that um, really uh, now, right? So in terms of uh, solar, okay, first of all, so I don't get any booing. I did um, super insulate my house 28 years ago. Okay, I gotta go fast now. So. Um, $1.73 was quoted for a solar system here in, uh, in the area, in the Tampa Bay area. Okay, you use that number and nuclear can't even touch solar. On top of that, nuclear gets 40-year amortization. You do 40-year amortization on solar and you get less than two cents a kilowatt hour. Let even gas beat that, okay? So basically another thing that this, the uh, Public Services Commission needs to understand very carefully is transit costs. 
When I start getting people off the grid, and then the, the utility goes to the Public Services Commission for more money because they have less customers, okay? You have stranded costs, you have a big problem. So that's the thing that the Public Services Commission needs to consider very seriously. December 20th, 2010, I was diagnosed with severe asthma. I lived 75% of my life in my bedroom. It is environmentally sealed, HEPA filters, dehumidifiers, humidifiers, and its own air conditioning system. I'm self-employed. I also work in my bedroom. Being self-employed, I don't get sick days. I don't get vacations. So when I don't feel good, I have to get up and work. I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine this. In the middle of the night as you're sleeping, you shoot up from the bed desperately gasping for air. While gasping, you frantically struggle to find your rescue and hammer on the nightstand. By the time you find it, you're in a full panic, unable to breathe. Even though you have your rescue and hammer in hand, you cannot take a deep breath to get the medicine in your lungs. Your, your panic worsens. Your spouse is trying to help. But again, your error is a clock. You can't calm down enough to take a deep breath. You hope that you're able to calm down enough to take the deep breath, or else your fingers turn blue and you have to have the paramedics come. This is what us as medics. Ogden, 190 18th Avenue North, 
St. Petersburg. And thank you for the great presentations this evening. We are happy not to have snow in Florida, but it's critical to our state, our real estate, to preserve the snow in the mountains and the north and in the poles, because Florida, Florida was underwater at one time. And think of everything we burn produces CO2. Think of CO2 as a blanket. The more we produce, it, the thicker it gets, the warmer the Earth is going to get. And Florida is heading for that underwater state. I've been documenting the disappearance of palm trees at North Shore Park as sea level rises and comes around the base of the tree. It's happening. The older docks are underwater at high tide. So let's, we have to do something about CO2. We have to get the snow back in the mountains and save our country, our world. Patricia Holmes. I live at 6357 2nd Avenue North at Fed Deep. Um, I decided to speak tonight because uh, I've been a tree hugger for my, oh, most of my life. But I know that I live under an oak tree or, or the shade that somebody else planted. And whenever we say, talk about trying to save the future, everybody goes, well, that's going to be 2100. I'm not going to be alive then. Well, that means you're not planting oak trees for somebody else to enjoy in the shade. You're not planning for the future of our children, of our grandchildren, of our great-grandchildren. I'm a third-generation Floridian. My son is a fourth-generation Floridian. I'm hoping for a fifth. <laughs> but, uh, the other thing I would say is that I'm very glad about the EPA and now putting a limit on carbon. The only fortunate, unfortunate thing is that they have no powers to fine or penalize somebody for not doing it. Um, the other thing I would say is that here in the United States, we call it an ocean surge. In Japan, it's called a tsunami. Now, if you remember what they went through and that atomic or nuclear power is still polluting the ocean, it's still the people of Fukushima cannot return to their home. They can go in there 45 minutes every month. They're still looking for bodies of their children, of their parents, of their wives. Um, we don't want this here. This is a beautiful state, and it's up to us to make everyone work to save it. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bruce Taylor. I reside at 131 35th Avenue Northeast in St. Petersburg, and I have been uh, born and raised in Pinellas County. Now, I want to start by saying I don't disagree with hardly anything that has been said here tonight, but I do want to add a different twist. It's my understanding the immediate question before the commission is whether or not to relax the energy efficiency standards uh, to a considerable extent. I want to say I have a great deal of confidence in uh, corporate America, and particularly in the power companies. They can meet the old standards with the finances and the resources uh, at their disposal and the pool of talent that they have. They can meet the old standards. Sometimes they need an incentive to meet those, and that's why we have uh, laws that uh, – Require them to meet certain efficiency standards. And therefore, I'm going to ask you to not take those incentives away because they can meet those standards if they try. And I want you to keep the old standards in place. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephanie Strickland. I am a resident of Tallahassee, but I'm down here in St. Pete because I'm an intern in Environment Florida. And um, I just wanted to say that um, this April, I worked with uh, Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and Southern Energy Network on the solar rally in Tallahassee, Florida. You may have heard of it. Um, and across the state, there were eight or nine of us organizing at universities. I was organizing at Florida State. And many people were organizing at FIU and different other uh, colleges. 
And people of our generation want this. Our generation is the solar generation. We are the people. We are the people moving to make this happen. And we met with thousands of people that would love this to happen. All in our age group, and everyone, and many people showed up and voted for clean energy in our ballots. And I just wanted to say that it's something that's so important. And I want to have a great future for my family, and I want to help make my family better. My parents both suffer from very severe asthma. My boyfriend had an asthma attack and had to go to a hospital like four days ago. And just quickly, there's something you may not know about Tallahassee. Um, Tallahassee does not actually produce any of its own power. Uh, it does not have any power plants, and it does not have any municipal trash dumps, which means that people up there are not responsible for what they put out. And that's something we have to do. We have to make them responsible for their own pollution up there because they can't pollute our water and our life just because they can't see it. Thank you. Hi, I want to thank everybody that did put this on tonight. I'm Linda Voronich. V is in Victor, A-R-O-N-I-C-H. I live at 1728 Lori Lane in Bel Air, Florida. I'm a Michigander, grew up next to Fisher Body. I used to know when they were going to paint because you could smell it in the air, and I'm asthmatic too. So I blame Fisher Body, but there's nothing there anymore to blame. It's already been uh, decimated. Um, and I fast forward to when I was a public health sanitarian in Michigan, and I had the occasion to meet the general who responded to the Chernobyl <clears throat> incident. He was one of the last surviving people in the, like, 1985, sorry, because all the first responders were dead that responded to the Chernobyl incident. Do we want that in Florida? I don't think so. Get rid of that 22 million stupid what nuclear idea, Governor, and all the other stuff that goes in. easy one for the Public Service Commission who seem to be very into um, baby steps. I was in Albuquerque last week and uh, had the occasion to go to the ABQ Biopark and view a movie called um, Acid Test Ocean. And in response to the carbon uh, comments that were made, it's not entertaining even though Sigourney Weaver uh, narrates it. It's about how shells cannot form in the Arctic for the fact that the ocean temperature rising and the acid changes in our oceans are killing uh, all the uh, marine animals to the tune of one out of four that rely on the coral reefs uh, to sustain, you know, and bigger fish eat the little fish. And as the other gentleman said too, you can look out the window and, and just sit on your piles of money. I don't think so. Dave Kovar, KOV is in Victor AR. I live in Safety Harbor at uh, 305 Los Palos Drive. I appreciate uh, this is a great event and uh, giving us an opportunity. I'm with the uh, Tampa Bay Clean Air Coalition, one member of the uh, Sunshine State Coalition. I've made this speech at uh, dozens of events. It's the same speech. It applies to solar power just like it does to transit, just like it does to the health care. Uh, and that is I'm tired of the way that America measures uh, cost. Um, there's a story, where's the person with the blueberries? Uh, bear with me. When uh, someone clear cuts a mountain for its coal, that makes money for the gross domestic product. If they turn around and send those workers into dark pits and they work all day and they don't come out for air, that adds money to the GDP. When they burn the dirty coal, that adds money to the GDP. And here's my favorite one. If everybody within 100 miles gets cancer, that adds money to the GDP yep. because we can hire more people in the hospitals, more, more pills from the pharmacy, and of course more grave diggers and sell more graves in the cemetery. Those are our job creators. 
we hear again and again that solar doesn't pay, that Germany has to subsidize solar, and that, uh, but, uh, that these other states have uh, said, we know that Germany subsidizes it, and that uh, other states have reached these uh, savings goals uh, that the profit makers dispute. We hear that coal is cheap, that fracking gas is cheap, that nuclear is cheap, but somehow solar power is expensive, and that's because of the way costs are measured. People don't put a cost on cancer. People don't put a cost on pollution. People don't put a, put a cost on the quality of life, and I frankly am sick and tired of it, whether we're talking about transit, whether we're talking about Medicare, uh, whatever. Or, uh, the value of uh, drilling in public parks, uh, national parks or Alaska, it's all the same. We're not measuring costs in the correct way. Thank you very much. I'm the floor organizer for Golf Restoration Network, and we are also a member of the coalition. Thanks to everyone for doing everything you did tonight to make this happen. Um, I do this for my grandson, and I brought, you can't see it, it's small, but I brought a picture of him tonight. He's 10 years old. He's the only one in our family with asthma. Uh, the only one born and raised here in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, it, so it's not genetic. You know, this, this is causative. Uh, but one of the things I want to talk about that hasn't been touched on, and you may not realize, these, the Public Service Commission, by not pushing renewable energy standards, by not pushing energy efficiency, creates a, a trumped up uh, need, quote unquote need, for new energy plans in this state. It is, manuf it is a manufactured number. And what the result of it, you might not realize that even now, uh, Florida Power and Light, in a company called Spectra Energy, is pushing to build a 300-mile natural gas pipeline called Sable Trail through our springs and rivers, through the Green Swamp, going to Orlando, going to the other coast. Why? Because we have a need which they have created for us. Uh, that is why you need to push for energy efficiency standards, the 1% should be happening now, it should be happening every year. That that is a direction we need to go to create jobs, to make this state a livable place, and to save our water. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Rosemary Gruba. I'm a resident of Brooksville, Florida, in Hernando County. I've come down here to St. Pete today so that my words can be heard by the Public Service Commission, who doesn't feel that the public has any right to make a comment. I think that the Public Service Commission should remember that its name is Public Service Commission, and that their job is to serve the public and not their own pockets and the greed of the giant power companies in our state. I would exhort them to pay close attention to the new EPA standards and to push and push very hard for our utility companies in Florida to get in line and also serve their customers. Thank you. in the Shore Acres area, so for those of you who are local, you know that uh, uh, there's ever, ever water rising, we're the first to know. Um, uh, we live on the water, but when the water rises, we have water front, front and back. Um, so I've experienced that, and uh, I, I, I'm glad to see the St. Petersburg Commission folks here in Pinellas County, because we are on the front line of climate change, and we're the first to, to be affected. Um, and I think that we should be on the front of the lines as far as uh, protesting what's happening in the Public Service Commission. I'm really glad to see that they're going and taking the buses to Tallahassee. Uh, I'm planning on being on one of those buses. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that sometimes Public Service Commission, someone said it, sometimes their job is to not hear uh, because they're being paid to not hear or not to pay attention. And uh, so I'm a big uh, proponent of catching people's attention uh, with nonviolent, non cooperation and protests. And, I just had an idea, I don't know how sound or safe it is or if it would work, so I leave it to more sane and experienced persons in the room. 
but I would think that if on July 19th, the Saturday before, everyone at 4 o'clock in the afternoon turned off their air conditioners, turned off their lights, and if they won't save energy, we'll show them how it's done. And of course, there is safety concerns as far as uh, you know, power outages and stuff, but I think uh, it's something that we could do. And if we did that at Pinellas County or St. Petersburg, I think that might get some attention. And, uh, you know, I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of the St. Pete area, and I'm speaking on behalf of the League. Uh, our location is in downtown St. Petersburg at 233 3rd Street North. Come visit us. I'm also a resident of St. Petersburg. Uh, the League of Women Voters of Florida and the local St. Pete area supports state legislation for energy conservation, greater use of renewable sources such as solar energy. The lake encourages the efficient use of energy in public and private sectors, new construction, and that it commits state funds to achieve those goals. This position is rooted in uh, intense study and our resultant commitment to conservation of our natural resources and the environment, our support for sustainable economy, and the promotion of effective solutions in transportation, including mass transportation. We've got the following specific concerns. One, we already have legislation in place in Florida to improve energy efficiency, but limited enforcement. Uh, we have technologies that are homegrown, available, and the intellectual resources here to make renewable energy a reality, but outsource those resources. We've left our residents with limited affordable energy options. Our commitment to renewable energy has actually gone down in the last five years rather than up. Our power companies continue to endorse substantial further reductions and reversal of renewable energy standards. Public Service Commission does not uh, make public comment easily accessible to its residents, making the process not transparent. Uh, we're, and we're not training the next generation of skilled workers in this area and putting people to work in a clearly robust economic sector. The impact of these things, our failure to invest in renewable energy sources, is disingenuous doesn't represent the interest of its residents, doesn't support the development of a sustainable economy, doesn't trust its citizens to make effective, affordable choices for their families, and compromises our collective uh, physical health. We respectfully request the following. One, hold public hearings. PSC, hold public hearings. Uh, make the process more transparent. Uh, increase civic engagement in this decision. Uh, uh, meet standards that are already in place. Meet standards established most recently by the EPA and reduce carbon emissions and address climate change in a meaningful way. Use resources we already have in Florida. Encourage private and public sector investment, put people to work, expand the solar pilot program, and incentivize residents and businesses to move to renewable sources of energy in their homes and places of work respectfully. Thank you. My name is Patricia Plantamira. I'm a city council member in Seminole, Florida, and I took some random notes, so bear with me here. Uh, I, I want to say first that Florida is a peninsula, and Pinellas County is a peninsula on a peninsula. Should we not be speaking up tonight? In fact, if we're not speaking up tonight, it's like sitting on a branch in a tree with a saw and sawing the branch that you're sitting on slowly well, this is going to accelerate, and the consequences are going to come a lot more quickly if we proceed in the manner in which we're doing. Um, about six months ago, I spent three weeks in Germany, and the people there, it was an urban fellowship, they sent me back with the German energy plan through 2050, the Inter German energy plan through 2050. And the, the bottom line, one of the principles is, the German government set itself the goal of making Germany one of the most energy efficient, and environmentally sound economies in the world while maintaining competitive energy prices and a high level of prosperity. And I have to emphasize that because I think a really, um, something that does not occur to people a lot is that to be environmentally responsible does not mean that it's excluding you from being economically prosperous. These are not mutually exclusive ideas. And when we get that, <laughs> We will move forward and we want both. 
And let me just tell you a couple of the uh, German plan things here. Like they have goals like um, primary energy demand will be progressively reduced by 80% by 2050. The, uh, by 2050, every building in Germany will be climate neutral. Another thing, after Fukushima, they were not only taking out some of their um, uh, uh, nuclear plants, but they're accelerating taking them out because they see the writing on the wall. And did you say stop over there? Oh. Yep. Is it up? Am I up? Oh. Okay. Then I guess that means I better stop. Let's just hack on. That was two minutes already. Good job. I'm a politician. Let's stop chopping the branch we're sitting on, okay? Actually, with that, uh, I apologize. I'm going, I, we have to place until nine o'clock, which is around that time. Um, and I don't want to suppress anybody's uh, anybody's voice. The uh, PSC is very good at doing that by themselves. We actually want to take your public comment um, for, on the comment cards. Uh, we want you to fill those out if you're unable to, to make a comment at the microphone or interested in writing it down. We want to hear your comment that way. And uh, yeah, we can go ahead and finish up the line here. And, I'm going to introduce afterwards our organizer, uh, Julia Bell. Well, we'll go ahead and finish up the, the rest of the comments, and just to let everybody know where. Uh, please fill out the comment cards if you didn't get a chance to speak. So. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. My name is Winnie Foster, and I live at 311 57th Avenue South. Mm. I am a grassroots organizer. Um, at the Sojourner Truth Center, and in studying Sojourner Truth's life, we know how important it is to speak truth to power. And to, so we're speaking our truth tonight to the Public Service Commission and, and sending many heartfelt messages and facts to them. Um, I'm also, our organization is also a member of the Sunshine State Clean Energy Coalition and we appreciate this community building work that is going on around us. I'm a great grandmother, and I am very concerned about global warming and what is this going to mean to future generations, but also to our lives right now. And um, the global warming is like a heavy blanket coming down on top of us. And some of the reasons for that are directly traceable to the work of the Public Service Commission and the permission that they give to utilities to use the fuels that they are using. Let me give you some statistics. Uh, the statistics, the amount of CO2 that is in our atmosphere comes from 44% of it is from the use of coal. Utilities are using coal, burning coal. And we know about the asthma. And 36% um, of the CO2 is from the burning of fossil fuels. We say to the Public Service Commission, keep the dinosaurs in the ground. 20% yeah. <laughs> comes from the natural gas and then we know the other complications of getting the natural gas and, and polluting widely everywhere that it goes. So um, I think we all need to do our civic duty. And that's the thing that I hear all the time. And I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. I understand that Germany is uh, the first uh, uh, solar, produce, uh, solar energy producer in the world. We are the Sunshine State. I am wondering where does the cloud cover that prevents the efficiency of uh, solar energy in Florida comes from? I'll let you speculate. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Chuck Turgeon. I am a citizen of St. Petersburg, Pinellas County, Florida, United States and the world. I take my uh, citizenship and my responsibilities as a citizen pretty uh, seriously. Um, 
not just am I responsible to myself, I'm responsible to my community and the future. I ask that the Public Service Commission consider their responsibility, uh, not just to themselves, but to also to their communities and to the future. I ask that they um, do what they can to serve the public that they should be serving, that they diminish the perception of corruption. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look and see money flowing into Tallahassee from, from power companies and then see policy made by the Public Service Commission that benefits power companies. Um, even if, if there isn't a direct quid pro quo, there is the perception of corruption that erodes our confidence as citizens in our elected and non-elected leaders to do their job. Um, I ask that they do what they can to make the standards for energy efficiency much uh, more robust than what they are doing. And absent that, they will perpetuate that perception of corruption. And it is our job to organize and to shame them, every one of them, for sacrificing our future. Yes, my name is Mark Skogman. I'm the host and executive producer of Spectrum 360 on the Tantalk Radio Network. Um, Dr. Helen Kellogg, a well-known anti-nuclear activist, has stated that 20% of the electricity in the United States is wasted. What is the percentage of, uh, of uh, energy in the United States that's generated by nuclear power? 20%. We can eliminate nuclear power with energy efficiency and, and increasing renewables. We need to commit to a Manhattan-style project, renewable energy uh, and energy security program in this country now. We can't let people who are obstructionists and wallowing in abject stupidity stop us from saving our civilization. Thank you. talking candidly for the three weeks that I was in, in Germany with people there, people are very careful about what they tell Americans. And I asked in discussions, please be frank with me about what you think America is doing in its energy policy. And people did not want to be frank. And finally, one group of people said to me, they said, you know, your country has such great ideas, people with great ideas, how come you don't use your own ideas in your own country? <laughs> They asked me. So, I mean, we're not asking for anything really weird. Let's use these great American ideas for making a better American future. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, for tonight. That's going to include uh, our, our public portion of the, the, uh, the event tonight. Oh, I actually also want to thank Michelle for being a great reporter. And definitely, you know, Michelle. 
Thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to hand it to Julia Hathaway, who can tell, who's going to tell you about all the great things that we're going to do moving forward. So thank you very much, everybody. Don't go! Don't go! Stay home! Be quiet! Stay quiet! And thank you all for coming!